Let me ask you about the, the background to you, the beginnings to you, because I mentioned in the introduction there that, in fact, you got a break, your first sort of big break, in a sense, in working in a Turkish bath yes. in Manhattan. Now, I mean, that's extraordinary to somebody in England. We don't have singers in Turkish baths. I mean, oh. how, how do you get the job? Well, uh, well, you have singers, you have Turkish bath, right? But you sort of have to put them together. But this is a very special Turkish bath. This wasn't just your everyday running the Turkish bath. It was an all-gay health club. I forgot to okay. mention that. <laughs> oh, you're so giddy. It was a gay, gay, gay place. I'm glad you mentioned it. <laughs> it was homosexual. Homosexual. Yeah. I have a little trouble saying that word sometimes, you know. <laughs> It was uh, gay, 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 and uh, this was before that. Like there was any like big gay thing in in, uh, in the states. They were, they had like a. They were all sort of hiding in their light in the closet, as it were. Mm. And uh, the, I was, you know, dis de destitute. I didn't have any money. I had quit this show that I was doing, and I was trying very hard to build my act and to, you know, learn all the things that you're supposed to learn as a performer. And this uh, teacher called me up and said, "I have a man who has has a, a gay health club, and he has an idea." And his idea is to put entertainment in this club and make, make it something more than a health club, make it a nightclub proposition, too. And so I said, oh, yes, I'll take the job. Because I didn't care at that point. I was, like, starving. And I got the job, and... Uh, well, I mean, what sort of an act did you do? Well, it was more a mishmash of possibilities than the... Uh, it, was, it was just a mishmash of possibilities. It wasn't the cogent, noble work that I am offering these days. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, I tried everything. I would try. I tried everything. I wore everything I owned. I wore, I remember taking the pillowcases off my sofa and wrapping them around my head. I uh, I uh, I stole music from people. I I stole arrangements. I stole clothes. I mean, literally. I mean, I would go into old friends' houses and sort of like look in their piano and see if they had anything that I could use. And that's what that's the kind of act that it was. But fortunately, it was presented with enough. Elan, enough spirit and enough good nature that that it went over. And besides, it was so bizarre yeah. to have this sort of bugsome blonde woman being trying so hard to please these men who were totally naked. <laughs> I, I was going to ask you about that. Were they? Were they naked? Well, they were they were naked, but they all were out of the, out of you know out of the generosity of their feelings for me. Out wore deference. a little towel yeah. out of deference. That's you yeah. speak English. I don't speak it too well. <laughs> and what, you know, did, what did they do when you were singing? Well, they listened, of course. <laughs> what did you think they were I'm doing? No next? I know. I know well, occasionally they would, but I wouldn't pay any attention. I was there. <laughs> I thought, well, if it makes them happy, you know, that sort of thing. You know, I, Isn't it nice that I can inspire such romance and passion in people and all that sort of rock? And of course, at that time, too, I mean, out of it came the, the, the taste for outrageous costumes, didn't it? That's where it yes. all started. Yes. I mean, where do you get your, your ideas from for, for the, the dresses or lack of them? <laughs> you know, I have a feeling that I'm going to wind up a stripper. You think so? I do. I think I do. I think that's what I think that's my calling. Well, you're I, halfway there already. I see that. <laughs> It's scandalous, isn't it? Scandalous? Yeah. Just like, just in the last six months, I've had like this. This vision has come to me. I, I this vision of nakedness. I mean, it's it's odd. It's very odd. I I I I was. Does I it frighten you? Well, it frightens me because it's almost as though it has nothing to do with me. It's just these little pictures come to my head, and I must follow them. You know, I, I must. I must. I must no. <laughs> Pull me down. Stop me when I go too far. When you were uh, when when you w went into this sort of outrageous dress, was the idea to to titillate or to, to titillate? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like your tits flew in a day too late. <laughs> Was the, Miss Lunch or something like was that. the idea to titillate, in brackets, provoke, or amuse? No. Well, actually, uh, neither. Well, amuse is, is much more to it. Although one doesn't mind titillating every now and again. I think it's good. It's very pleasant. I think it's very pleasant. I like that kind of, uh, the kind of, I like it when an audience sort of salivates. You know? I do. I, 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 I've, uh, 
changed a lot of people's lives, if I do say so myself. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I think he can take you up a, 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 take it, becoming a sex therapist for Masters and Johnson. <laughs> um, did you have this, uh, did you have this uh, obsession of dressing up when you were a kid? I never had any clothes when I was a kid. I had, um, my mom used to make all my clothes. My mother used to make all my clothes, and my mother was like the greatest seamstress in the world. And she took great, we were three girls, and uh, she took great pride in dressing us all alike, you know? So even though you wore out your particular dress, your sister's dress was gonna come down to you next year. So you always got, you were always wearing the same clothes. Finally, I discovered uh, uh, the, the girly magazines, you know, the true confessions and the modern romance. And in the front of those magazines, they had something called, uh, they had ads for something called Fredericks of Hollywood, which I thought were the greatest. Actually, this dress is a sort of a ripoff of one of Freddie's creations. It's, uh... How would you describe it? Well, it's, uh, disgusting is what it is. <laughs> it's totally lacking in any sort of... And it has a tassel. I don't know if you can see it. It's the most disgusting thing I've ever had on my body. And I really, I, it just makes me feel like such an old chippy to wear it. <laughs> Which is what I, I think you have to have. You have to be a sort of a, have a little bit of that in you to get out and do what I do. I'm going mad here. I really wanted to be a, a great actress, you know. Did you, I wanted did to you be, act as a child? Always. Always, I lied a lot, and I, <laughs> and that's kind of acting. Yeah. And I and I uh, did a lot of readings, you know. What did you used to do? Can I was remember? an interpretive reader. Interpretive reader. Yes, I was a state champion, my dear. Um, I was, because nobody else wanted the job. What were your party pieces? Do my you my party pieces. Yeah, your party pieces. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Told me you had great legs. Thank you. <laughs> I just said, uh, let you have a pull if I can have a prod. <laughs> I see. I thought movies were all was all going to be Ginger Rogers and and uh, Fred Astaire and Dan Daly and and Betty Grable. And I was dancing. I was sort of started out to be a dancer when I was about eight years old. And I thought that you know what? If I ever got to be in in films or, or on the stage, that I, that's what I would like to do. But when I came along, that was not what was going on at all. People wanted to see realism, and they didn't really take to the idea that glamour was a good thing. It was considered superficial plastic and all of this. Um, perhaps it is in a way, but I think it also has um, um, something to offer. Oh, I agree with you. Absolutely. <laughs> You've got a lot to offer. <laughs> oh, I walked into that. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> no, but, uh, no, no, but um, no, in the nicest possible way, I meant that. But, but were you, in fact, um, were you from the beginning? Were, were you an attractive child? Were you, were you a good-looking kid? I don't really think I was. I think I had, like, hair part in the middle and braids, and my dad always said, you know, that I should be very, I don't know, sort of, neat in appearance and I wasn't allowed to wear ruffles or bright colors or have my hair in curls like a lot of girls I, yeah. that went to school with me. So I never really thought of myself as pretty pretty. Yeah. But when I, um, uh, when I got a little bit older and uh, the equipment arrived, the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well then I thought, gee, this is pretty terrific, maybe I ought to try it out a little, you know. <laughs> And I sort of strut my stuff around and <laughs> see how it all worked, and it worked pretty good. I bet, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but when you were, were you sort of first... But, I... <laughs> <laughs> but what, about, what about, I mean, the day you were, you arrived in Hollywood with all the equipment, as Michelle <laughs> said. Oh, uh, with ha thousands and millions of uh, other girls, other and girls. even walking down the street oh, much, now, much better. Oh, we're now petrol pump attendants. Oh, I don't think so. Well, you know, they're certainly not, uh, they're certainly not uh, starring in movies. But I mean, what was it? I mean, was it a difficult thing there to be to be treated seriously? Or, I mean, I'm was thinking about the casting couch business in Hollywood. I mean, oh. did you get chased around the table? <laughs> well, I don't know. That's kind of an X-rated item. <laughs> Go on, tell me the truth. Um, <laughs> not really. No, there were a few times when people disappointed me a little bit, but it wasn't really. <laughs> <laughs> oh, help! Somebody help! <laughs> no, I, uh, did I? Yes, I did. 
<laughs> I said what I thought I said. Um, no, it's not like the carpet baggers, which my mother had given me recently to read and said that is what Hollywood, what Hollywood is all about. It wasn't like that. Yeah. No, a few wolves, but there's wolves in, in any nightclub, discotheque, uh, uh, restaurant. Yeah. I remember one time there was this guard at this gate, and I came in to see a screening of a film of mine, and I walked by, and he said, hello, and I, then later I could walk by, and he said, do you like how I said, yeah. Do you like how I said, yeah. He said, yeah, I thought, I said, I know you thought I was <laughs> And it's true, I mean, I'm okay, you know, but I'm really, um, I guess you could say petite. I don't know if I'm really petite, but I'm only 5'6", and I've got very small bones can you see i've got yeah. small bones yeah. and i'm not um sort of an amazon and um and i'm not going to break anybody in half and i wish you would <laughs> oh are you one of those hit me again type <laughs> <laughs> But, I mean, you, you had this uh, fairly abrasive career with Hollywood, didn't you? I mean, you... I would say, yeah. yes, a bit. Mm -hmm. Well, it, I mean, extraordinary that you started off so big and then you had this sort of period... Well, you see, I, that was, I mean, I'm a perfect example of what we were speaking of earlier, is that I started off so big at the age of 19, totally unequipped for it. No experience. Talent, totally undirected. So, I mean, I didn't know really what I was doing at all. In a medium that was totally strange to me and unprotected, because the man that I was under contract to didn't think it was important to protect me, or, or any actor. So, uh, from that point of view, uh, it was it was stardom overnight, and then I dare you to live up to it. <laughs> well, I couldn't live up to it, you know, so it was as fast as I went up, that's how fast I fell down, and spent really the rest of my career just trying to kind of get to some middle ground where I could function, because yeah. it was... Uh, yeah. Yes. I know, um, and you I... You look so serious. Uh, well, no, 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 I was, I'm listening. I'm listening to you. I'm, I, was, I, was, I was interested. I know, I know that you don't like that talking about... <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I know that you don't like talking about, uh, about Humphrey Bogart, and uh, there are very good reasons, which I, I respect, but could I just ask you a couple of questions? What was that butt you just threw in there? <laughs> um, because you said there that they were unprotected in, in Hollywood. Um, but in, in, in effect, I mean, you were protected by, you were talking about great stars and you missed him out there and for, for obvious reasons you did. But he was a great star. Oh, no question. Because no he, question. Was a, he was a very good actor too. Indeed. Uh, but what, and stage trained. Yes. But how, what, what did you learn from him about acting? What, what was it the, that he, he taught you? Well, about acting, I mean, Bogie always believed, as I do now, and I don't know how much of it came from, I guess a great deal of it came from him, is that you are not an actor if you don't act. That you cannot just sit in your living room and say, gee, I'm terrific, folks, but you'll never get to see it. <laughs> you know, and, you, and you, that you, you, um, you have to try things, uh, that one must certainly um, aim for quality first. That is the most important thing, and that if you work with the best people, and are always, I mean, all of the best actors, in other words, one, I mean, I, I don't believe in, uh, one-man shows. I don't believe in vehicles. Uh, Bogey didn't either. Um, he believed in doing the best work that you can do. He had great respect for the acting profession, which I do as well. Mm. And, um, but when I speak of the profession of acting, I'm speaking of actors. I'm not speaking of flukes, you mm. know, or luck for a few years. I'm mm. speaking of something that is much deeper than that. Mm. He represented, too, of course, something which you've got now, this extraordinary sort of uh, independent spirit, was he not, in, in, in Hollywood, and he wouldn't take any, any nonsense from... from well, he was much more independent than I am. I mean, he was much... Uh, he was totally his own man, and he knew exactly what he was about, and followed that course, mm. and fought anyone that tried to make him do less than he could do, or be less than he was, and would never compromise. Mm. How, how difficult was it to, to, for you, Laura, and afterwards to, to live down the thing of just being Bogie's widow? Is that a very difficult thing to do? Well, it's still going on, isn't it? No, no, it's not. Not, not as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Are you no, sure? So. I'm absolutely sure, yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll move off the subject in, really in a moment, but I just wondered just how difficult it was, because obviously it was, I mean, and still is, because you've got this, this cult thing about, about him. Well, I mean, I think that's wonderful. That, he deserved that. Yes. Uh, uh, anyone that was that extraordinary, that gifted, as an actor, uh, in addition to being as gifted as he was as a human being, which was really above and beyond what most people ever are in their lives, or that you ever meet in your lifetime, he deserved, I mean, he rates every 
every cult that there can possibly be from every generation and he's timeless i mean i think this will go on forever long after my life is over mm. um but as far as my relationship <clears throat> with him is concerned that was our own mm. and that uh, i'm i just think it's very boring of the press to continually talk about that i mean i did say once and i'll say it again hopefully for the last time that being a widow is not a profession no. and that you live your life the best you can and uh, when a certain section of your life is over you deal and that's very private mm. and then you have to press on and do something else for yourself because you're the only one that's left so i am entitled to a life of my own and i'm going to have a damn it quite a view of michael parkinson <laughs> and you're not with him, you'll regret it. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but soon and for the rest of your life. But what about us? We'll always have Paris. We didn't have, we, we lost it until you came to Casablanca. We got it back last night. And I said I would never leave you. And you never will. But I've got a job to do, too. Where I'm going, you can't follow. What I've got to do, you can't be any part of. Hilda, I'm no good at being noble, but it doesn't take much to see that the problems of three little people don't amount to a hill of beans in this crazy world. Someday you'll understand that. No, no. He's looking at you, kid. Did you know when you were uh, making that, that film, Casablanca, that it would one day become the, the cult movie that it is now? No, I certainly did not at all. It was a great confusion during the, the shooting of the picture, and uh, I'm quite surprised, but I must say I saw the picture here at the Film Institute about two years ago for the first time on the screen, not on television, mm. and uh, I really thought it was a very good movie. It is a good movie. <laughs> it's a, I mean, all I'm a, surprised. <laughs> all, I mean, there, there aren't many films out there that made that long you can look back at and think yes. that's a good, good movie. It stands yes, up. It was know. good also because all the parts were played by such good actors. The smallest part was really a top-class actor. Yes. So that helped a lot. Yes. Is it true it was made in, in, in as you say, in some confusion, haphazardly? I mean, nobody had a real yeah. idea. No, we didn't have the script. It was written as we went along. And to tell you the truth, no one knew, knew how to end it. So we went along uh, until the bitter end. <laughs> and it was very bitter because they said I should shoot it both ways. Either I should go with the husband in the plane, played by Paul Henry, or stay on the ground with Humphrey Bogart. <laughs> and it was very difficult to act out these love scenes because I really didn't know uh, which one of the two men I was in love with. <laughs> but it doesn't show. <laughs> no, it doesn't indeed. You went off with the right fella in there. I think. What about um, Bogart? Because he's grown into a cult figure too, hasn't he? Yes, so oh, very much so. What, what, what is the appeal? I mean, were you able to, to assess it when you were working with him? No, of course he was an excellent actor. And he always played himself, of course. He didn't make any uh, character uh, makeup or change or anything. As a matter of fact, I think he, he wore the same raincoat and the same hat in every movie. <laughs> <laughs> he must have been terrible to be close to. <laughs> 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 but he had that marvelous voice yes. that you could hear right now this minute. It was such an interesting and rough voice. And of yes. course, he was also considered a tough man, but I think that inside he was quite a lovable person. Did, did you, you say you think so. Didn't you get to know him at all? No, I, I really didn't. I think he was as upset as everybody else about not having a script and not knowing exactly where we were going. And uh, he used to stay very much by himself. And, um, well, in, in another interview, because I've talked a lot about Casablanca. Ignore all the other interviews. <laughs> it's the first time you've talked to me. And. Um, they used to ask me if I knew him, and I said, no, I don't know him. I kissed him, but I don't know him. <laughs> <laughs> it must be very difficult, mostly, particularly playing a romantic part opposite somebody that you literally don't know. I mean, you just no. see on the set. No, it isn't difficult uh, when you look like Humphrey Bogart and <laughs> you can act like he does. And uh, I think he's absolutely wonderful. I mean, I'm so pleased when I see that he looks at me with such love in his eyes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Very flattering. Yeah. Do you like English men? Or have I you like some English men. Some English men. I haven't met that many of them. I adored Alan Bates. I liked working with him. Mm -hmm. He had a, uh, he was quite, quite, quite an interesting fellow. 
<laughs> what about royalty? Do you remember him in that movie, Women in Love? Oh, I do. The new dressing scene. Do you remember that? No, oh, well, yes, of course. No, I remember the fig sucking scene. You do? Yes. Did he suck the fig? Yes, he did. <laughs> Literally changed my life. I did didn't... He... <laughs> You mentioned there about leading men. I mean, in your mm. long career in Hollywood, you must have worked with most of the uh, best-known leading men in the business, I suppose. Well, I should say Valentino. Valentino worked with... Valentino. Ask, Valentino. That's what he insisted on, was it? But, I mean, what was he like, Valentino? That's the strange part about it. I first met him when I was writing... Uh, we used to, on Sundays, was the only day we had off. And I liked horseback riding, as many people did out there, and so we'd meet in the Hollywood Hills, and I was already a star, and he and I would look down at that little place down there called Hollywood, and he had dreams. He wasn't a star in those days. His reputation was dreadful. He was called a gigolo. What did that mean? It meant that he danced with people and maybe got paid for it. So I didn't think that was horrible. He had ex very good manners. He was a gentleman. He was nice and kind. And uh, so then when he did the Four Horsemen, of course, all the people that said these dreadful things about him were there at the opening, darling, darling, how wonderful. And I was standing over in the corner watching all this nonsense. So Eleanor Gwynn, incidentally, a British lady, had written my first starring picture when I left the mill. And it was called The Great Moment. And then she had seen Valentino, so she wanted him to be in the picture with me. So what she did was write a story beyond the, um, beyond the rocks. And so we made a picture together. And I found him very charming and a very nice man. But uh, I knew nothing about his private life whatsoever. You didn't find him sexy? I didn't think of him in that way. Out in the picture, I suppose, when you're doing a love scene with somebody, you probably feel... That's what he might be, yes. But which of all your leading men did you most sort of, not fall in love with, but, but found it possible you might have fallen in love with him? Well, which I you can most say attracted two. To? Two. <clears throat> well, shall we go backwards in chronological order? Uh, naturally, Holden. William Holden? Yes. A wonderful actor and a wonderful man. And I, my mother said he was the handsomest man she'd ever seen. And then I would say Olivia. Olivia, yeah. She made a film here in Britain with him, didn't yes, you? Yes, well, I've made one of the first talking pictures here, and that was a rugged experience. And, uh, oh, I think we're going to have a little clip of it. We've got a clip from it, yes. It, in fact, oh, you're so beautiful. Olivia was. Oh. Yeah. I wish women would look at me like that. Um, oh. Here we are. It's coming up here now. This is a film with Olivia where you're singing, in fact. I am always asked, did I name the Oscar? And fascinatingly enough, the only night I was not asked this question was in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the night of the Oscar show, which I thought was very, very strange. 
Yes, I've always asked that. I was asked that uh, everywhere in Australia and New Zealand. What's the answer? Uh, well, I feel I did. How? The, well, uh, my first husband's middle initial was O, and he never would tell me what it was because he detested the name so. And finally, I found out that the, uh, his middle name was Oscar. And uh, the rear end of the Oscar looked like him. <laughs> rear end. And I always called it Oscar. Now, I, the Academy uh, refuses to accept this, and I sort of willingly say the Academy. I see. But that's my memory of it. Of course, it was a long time ago. Yes, that's the kind of a lasting monument, isn't it? If that's, uh, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Yes, yes, he has a lasting monument. Yes. That's right. How determined were you, in fact, to get to Hollywood as such? Oh, I, I never thought of that. I always thought of I started out in the theatre mm. in the beginning, and then talking pictures came along, and they wanted everybody from theatre to, to, to come and see who would, who would be good in, on the screen. And so we all just went. It was a new adventure, and one felt one should try it. And mm. just in my case, worked out that I never went back. Mm. They weren't, I mean, you weren't, of course, exactly, um, if you'd looked at Hollywood at that time, and it's kind of the kind of women who succeeded, you were hardly somebody you put the money on, would you, to succeed? None of us, none of us really were the same type, you see. Mm. We were great puzzlements. Uh, we weren't beautiful women. We weren't, uh, we didn't sort of behave in a Hollywood way off screen, you know. And we were not glamorous women from the theater. That's no. right. We were puzzlements. Yes. So, I mean, how much puzzlement did you cause to the people in Hollywood? I mean... Well, you know, quite a few years of puzzlement. <laughs> <laughs> it took a long time for them to recover. When you were, when you first went there, you said you were a puzzlement to all these people, and indeed you must have been. Did they um, ever try to tart you up, glamorize you? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, in a film called Fashions of 1934. Yes, they made me up as nearly as possible to look like Miss Garber, which, of course, is utterly impossible. They gave me the lovely long bob and the nice, beautiful wide mouth and the long, long lashes. Uh, it, it, was, it was really sickening because it wasn't my type. And thank God I had brains enough to know that, you know, and I never let them do that again. Yes. How do you mean you never let them do that again? Because you, 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 I just didn't. I just said you cannot either fire me or let me be what I personally am. You yes. cannot, you cannot be somebody else but or a, a copy or anything else. But as a contract artist, of course, I would imagine that, that took a certain amount of guts, didn't it? Well, yes. Yes, I was a meddler for my own good, but it becomes, it becomes self-preservation, really, if it, if it had continued that way. And they did that with so very many theater people they brought out, you know, changed all their teeth, changed their noses, changed everything. And, and those who had any individuality uh, just never made it because they just looked phony. Yes. I, I suppose it was easier for you in a sense in that you had a talent. I can't do the Paul Henry bit. Well, I, I wasn't... <laughs> I wasn't... Uh, you keep dropping them. I didn't feel so terribly uh, talented as regards working in front of the motion picture camera in the beginning. I really didn't. It was, uh, I, didn't know, I didn't know then whether I had real talent or not. Well, what do you... I knew I, I, knew I loved it. Yes. But I, I didn't know if it would work out. What about, though, you mentioned this thing about if you, if you did get uh, awkward with the uh, studio bosses in Hollywood, or at that time were all powerful in, under that system. Um, if you crossed them, wasn't there a danger, no matter how talented you were, of, of being uh, suspended indefinitely? Well, no, because in the very beginning you don't cross them very much. You know, in the very beginning I made eight and ten films a year, dreadful films. Really? Oh, dreadful. Parachute Jumper was the name of one. Parachute? <laughs> yes. I played Soda Jerks. I played Bureau of Missing Persons. Oh, I can't remember the terrible titles and the terrible scripts. You know, and, but you did that in the beginning. You, yes. you, in the beginning, you could not choose your own material, naturally. Yes. 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 And then finally, if you had any courage, you... You had to, to do something about it, or you never would have had a career. Yes. Of course, I suppose of Human Bondage was, in fact, the film that was one of the big... That was the first it. step on the ladder. That's right. And that was a loan out to our... Run. Yes. That's right. And you played a cockney, didn't you? Yes, uh, I did. Can yes, you still I do did. the accent? Well, I'm not going to sit here and do it. 
<laughs> Just wondered if you could, that's all. Oh, yes, I, I received many compliments. Of course, when I started the film with all the all English cast, particularly Mr. Leslie Howard, they were very, very distraught. Really? They're all very upset when American girls playing it. Really? Very. But you gradually won them. Oh, over. I don't mind. That's what Mildred said. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't mind. But nonetheless, for all this, you, you were a star. Uh, you are a star. And you allow yourself, no doubt, and I know because it's in your book, to be pampered and treated like some sort of shampooed poodle. I mean, I mean, tell, tell them what it was like to be a star when, when, when you My were there. My makeup man used to have to knock me down and tackle me to put the makeup on me. <laughs> I didn't like being pampered, really. But what was it like, though, the system at the time? I mean, what was the setup like and stuff? What being a star yeah. mean? Well, you were expected to... Uh, to lie back and enjoy it, I suppose. But that's part of the seduction. That's part of the, uh, of the exercise of uh, believing your own myth, which is, you know, crap. You're not, you're not anybody special, except that you excel in the art of emulating human life. That's where the specialty comes from. The fact that you make a lot of money or that you're privileged or that people should treat you with any more special attention than anyone else is what makes it very difficult to adjust to success. Success is so much tougher to adjust to than, than struggle. Failure is tough too, but, but struggle is, is where the real happiness lies. And when all of us, you know, I like Hollywood. I'm, I'm, not, um, I'm not one of those who, who really knocks it and means it. There's a lot about it that I would knock and be seriously concerned with. And what would you I, knock about it? Well, for example, uh, to cast pictures with stars according to the box office receipts of their last pictures is silly. Some of the finest actors in the world can't get work for two or three years because their last picture didn't do well. That's really awful. Mm. That's not commensurate with good art or good industry. Mm. And the real secret, it seems to me, is to find the right subject matter, the right screenplay, and have the courage to cast that person, whether he or she is a star or not, mm. in it, and then you'll make yourself a star. Mm. Do you find it that problem, the problem of being the, the artist in Hollywood, um, the one you just specified, all the more difficult because you were a woman? In the sense that, um, you know, Hollywood's run by men. In the main, the directors in Hollywood are men. Yeah. It's really interesting now, Michael, what's going on. The parts for women don't exist. You mm. might have noticed. Robert Redford's playing all our parts. <laughs> <laughs> He's prettier than a lot of his suits, so I don't that's begrudge him that. But I, <laughs> I started to figure that out the other day. I was walking on the beach in Malibu, and I thought, what on earth is really going on here? And then I remembered that in the old days, the old days meaning the 40s and the 50s, when the Hayes office was the censorship board, and you had Barbara Stanwyck and Joan Crawford and uh, Catherine Hepburn playing women judges, women politicians, women mayors, women scientists, blah, blah. You were not allowed to play a love scene in the bedroom with a double bed, had to be two twin beds, even if the couple was married, and regardless of what the scene was, one of the people had to have one foot on the floor. Mm. Right. I don't know what, I could never figure out what difference that made, could you? You could figure out something to do with that, that'd be really kinky. That's but... right. <laughs> so what happened was, since they couldn't play any real good sexy love scenes, they had to resort to giving women these parts that were sensational in real life. The Hayes office was abolished in the name of more liberal sexual attitudes, and the rating system came in. Well, now, because men were running the studios, men were writing the scripts, and men were the directors, they put us back in the bedroom. And we haven't been judges or politicians or mayors since. We've been screwing out in the bedroom for the last <laughs> We can't get out of the bedroom. Kissy, kissy. Kissy, kissy. Hello, Michael. Oh, hello. <laughs> How are you? Oh, I'm well. I... <laughs> Hi, Frog. <laughs> Good evening, Miss Piggy. <sighs> <laughs> you, you have such deep blue eyes. Yes, and you have bedroom eyes. <laughs> Let me see. <laughs> well, they're dining room eyes, anyway. <laughs> I've been d dying to meet you. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm so taken aback by this meeting. 
Could I just ask you one deeply personal question? Of course. Is that a toupee? <laughs> Listen, if things, if things go right, you might learn the truth later on about the toupee. <clears throat> Michael, uh, is, your, uh, <clears throat> is your wife here? Well, actually, she, she is, Miss Piggy. She's oh. sitting in the audience. I see. We're, we're very good friends. Oh, wait, you are with my wife? Mm -hmm. We've uh, talked about you. Oh. <laughs> I know some things about you. Well, like what? Your legs. <laughs> legs. You have great legs. <laughs> to me, he has wonderful legs. Oh well, uh, wonderful. I, I'm I'm very uh, happy for him. Could be possibly, possibly. <laughs> I mean, I I don't know how to ask this. But... Piggy, lift him up, kid. <laughs> I'd, I'd love to. Would you? Yes. All right. Now, next look. I have never in my life. <laughs> Those are exquisite. Would you like to touch them? Could I? Yes. <gasps> Thank you. you. You have made a woman pig happy. Could I, could I in return, could I, could I stroke your hair? Because I'm... Don't stop there. <laughs> You really are beautiful. Watch it. That's fantastic. Thank you. Kimmy. Kimmy. Yes. I just want you to know that Michael and I, this little tete a tete, he and moi am having, is not, nothing serious. Okay. I mean, it's, it is nothing lasting. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's nothing lasting. It's, oh. it's something that will pass. Oh, okay. Well, all right. Mm -hmm. <coughs> sure. He gets deeply jealous. I don't blame him. I mean, I'd, I'd go overboard for you. I really would. What's it like being a sex symbol? Oh, it's a, it's a deep responsibility to be... <laughs> to be a taste setter in fashion. To be a sex symbol and a, a pig superstar. Fantastic. Yes, I feel I can weather up under the storm. I have taste. I have style. Yes, you have all that. And I can cut it. <laughs> <laughs> you, do, you do tend to get a bit aggressive at times, I've noticed. I mean, you've got this very... Well, your wife told me you left that. Oh. <laughs> you, uh, you really have been talking to her, haven't you? <laughs> Uh, no, 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 Miss Piggy, you're, you're not mine. It, it's okay. Been, uh, go right ahead. Jealous. Is he jealous? Mm -hmm. He's jealous. Well, let's, he let's make him just a little bit more jealous. Let's talk again. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, were we bothering you? Uh, no, no, of course not. It doesn't bother, it doesn't bother me at all. <clears throat> the night here is young and pigs and interviewers have things to do. <laughs> All right, my darling. Well, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Oh, May I just, yes? just have a little pet goodbye? Yes. 